Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Alpine Church. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the teachers here. Uh, and I am excited to be with you today as we are finalizing our series uh, in the book of Galatians. Now, if you've been with us all six weeks, I want to say congratulations. You've made it through uh, the book of Galatians with us. And, and I hope that you have been uh, really encouraged and spurred on as we have been digging into God's Word. You know, there's just something about going through an entire book of the Bible and pulling out uh, what God is trying to say to us through that book. And, and so I hope that you have been spurred on. You've been challenged. You know, we believe here at Alpine uh, that the Bible is living, it's active, it penetrates our hearts and our minds, it transforms our lives, and so I hope that is what has been happening with you through the book of Galatians. I also hope that this has spurred on additional conversations. You know, we believe here at church that it's not just about a 30-minute message online or at the church campus, but really it's about empowering conversations that you would continue to allow God's Word to transform you. Maybe you've had uh, some additional conversations about the book of Galatians uh, with uh, maybe a small group or in a mentoring relationship, uh, maybe with your spouse and with your kids. We just hope that you have utilized the resources that we have available to you here at Alpine Church and at Pursue God. And so today, as we conclude our series uh, in chapter 6 of Galatians, uh, we really want to give you kind of a recap of what's happened up to this point. Uh, you may know that the book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul uh, to a church that he started on his very first missionary journey. Uh, you know, Paul had his life radically transformed as he met Jesus one day on the road to Damascus. Paul was a, a legalistic Jew. Uh, he was one who followed the law uh, to a T. And we see that God transformed his life and gave him a new message a new message to speak, which was a way to be in relationship with the living God was only through Jesus Christ. And so as Paul was out spreading this uh, gospel message to other regions, uh, word got back that there was this Jewish group, these Judaizers that were infiltrating this Galatian church with a bad theological message. What they were doing is they were telling these new Gentile believers that in order to be made right with God, not only did they need to have a relationship with Jesus, but they also had to do other things, right? These Judaizers were saying that they had to be circumcised, that they had to follow the laws of Moses. They were saying that there had to be other things involved in their relationship with God. So what we see is their message was salvation equals Jesus plus something. Jesus plus works. And so what we see is Paul writes this book of Galatians to remind them that this was not the right message, that the message that he initially gave them was a message from God. And that message was this, that salvation is through Jesus and nothing else. Our faith in the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. And so as we've been digging through uh, the book of Galatians, we saw in the first four chapters, Paul uh, really fighting for them to understand this deep theological understanding of the foundation of our church. We see that, that he was willing to have difficult conversations with church leaders, with, uh, with friends of his, with, with the, the Gentile believers in Galatia. He wanted them to know that this was not a debatable issue, that this was a to die for issue that our relationship with God can only be made right with Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. And so last week, if you were here, we saw what that meant for us practically in our life. Uh, we saw that as we move from th the theological understanding to now how that plays out in our life. And we saw that when, when we accept God, we receive his very presence living inside of us through the Holy Spirit. And the result of that is that we would live to honor him. And so when we put our faith in Jesus alone, God then takes residence in us through the Holy Spirit, and our lives are changed from the inside out. And so really what we see Paul saying is this, that good doctrine really should lead to life transformation. 
a good understanding of theological doctrine of the church that, that our relationship with God is with Jesus and nothing else, then leads us to life transformation. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to close in the sixth uh, chapter of Galatians. And we're really going to see Paul show us how this life transformation should took place. Uh, really in three pra practical areas of our life. And so if you're taking notes with us or if you're following along, uh, we're going to start with this point today. Really the first area of transformation is this. Transformation is relational. And so true believers, uh, true people who have had their life changed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ alone, should then gently and humbly help people when they fall into sin. You see, it's almost as if Paul is shifting from this general message to the Galatian church, a, a very kind of general one that's maybe a personal one, and he's moving into it being a corporate one, more so in the church. And so what he's doing is, is he's showing them that this life change should be relational. And the way that he does this is he brings us back to something that we learned about in the very first week of Galatians, right? It was this central theme or this theme of the sweet spot of grace. And so what Paul was saying is that when it comes to a new understanding, when someone falls into you know, a specific area of sin, uh, there was really two kinds of things that could happen. One is they could uh, be kind of judged or misjudged or could be led to this understanding that their relationship with God or their faith was based on works. And so here you had these Judaizers saying that if you didn't fall into this category, if you didn't work for it, if you didn't have circumcision or you weren't following the law or if you were falling short of God's standard, maybe if you were living in sin, uh, they were pointing fingers. And so there was this legalistic way of living. But then there was this, uh, maybe this other extreme. Right, And this other extreme is saying, well then, if I don't have to follow the law, or I don't have to obey the Ten Commandments, if it's all about the grace of God, then does that mean I just have the freedom to sin? Uh, does that mean that I just have the ability to do whatever I want? And Paul was saying, no, it's neither of these things. Really what it is, is that we live and we breathe and we do everything in our lives by the grace of God. And the overflow of that then is changed lives. And so what Paul was saying is that when we engage someone in relationship, uh, we don't come at them based on legalism or works, uh, telling them how terrible they are if they're living in sin, that they're not worthy enough, uh, that they're not good enough. You know, maybe you grew up in a religion that demanded that kind of worthiness. Paul was saying that is not at all what we're going to do. And then he says, and on the other side, we shouldn't have the freedom to live in sin. And if we see a brother or sister falling in sin, that we should confront that. But we should do it with the understanding of grace and love. Listen to what the, the Apostle Paul says in the very first verse of chapter 6. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin... You who are godly should, please listen, gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And he says then, be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. And he says, instead, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. You know, so when it comes to our community of faith, our community of relationships, how should we handle living for God? You know, if we see someone who is falling short of the glory of God, or if they are going their own way and they are living in sin, Paul says that we shouldn't come at them in the legalistic extreme. Instead, what we should do is we should humbly love them. We should encourage them into repentance. We should encourage them to live in the grace of God. And he doesn't go on to say, well, listen, we don't want to rock the boat. And so if someone's over here living in sin, you know, we're just going to go ahead and let them do that. We're just going to be loving and caring and we're not really going to say anything and, you know, maybe I'm just a little bit uncomfortable. I have my own sin in my life. You know, how am I supposed to go and confront someone else? 
Well, Paul says that we have a responsibility to come together as Christ followers, as one family of God, and we need to lovingly and humbly and gently correct one another. And you see, I think oftentimes what happens in life is we have these two extremes. You know, we have these people, even in church, that say, if you're falling short of God's standard, if you're not measuring up, then you failed. You're a failure. You're not worthy enough. God's not going to love you. Well, that is not the truth whatsoever. And on the other side of that, this doesn't mean that, hey, do whatever you want. It's this license to sin is to live freely. No, what Paul was saying is that we live every day in the sweet spot of grace. And we begin to see that as we depend and rely on the grace of God, that it changes every part of us. It changes our relationships. It changes, uh, you know, how we interact with one another. You know, you might be like me and you're thinking, well, you know, there are people in my life that have sinned against me. And I have a lot of emotions when they've done that. Or maybe there's someone in your life that you care about and you love so much, but they're living in sin. And so there's all of these emotions that are tied with it. Listen, you know, I think for me, when my kids sin or when my kids sin against me, there's just this, uh, this variety of emotions that I might have, right? I might be angry if they've sinned against me, you know, and my natural response to them is to be angry and, and to be upset. You know, there might have been things that have happened or there have been things that have happened in, in the life of my children that have really hurt me, that I've seen that they've lived in sin and the consequences of those sins have, have made me cry. And, you know, there are just some of those times where I've just had to laugh hysterically for the amount of, uh, of disrespect and how crazy our kids can be at sometimes. But here's what, what I want you to understand. In the midst of those emotions, I still love them. I love them with everything I have. And so I'm able to move past the emotional response. I'm able to move past the response to sin, the anger, the hurt, or whatever it is to sin. And I'm able to move past that, and I'm able to gently, lovingly, and humbly restore them and remind them of the grace of God. And you see, we need to understand that in the midst of these things, we too are sinners, I have to ask my children all of the time for humility and for grace on how I've fallen short in fathering them or in parenting them. And you see, this is the idea that Paul is getting, uh, trying to get across, that it is our responsibility to do something as Christ followers, that we now live differently and that the transformation that happens in our life is relational. And we begin to point people to the sweet spot of grace in hopes that it would restore them, and it would renew them. And so we have this idea uh, that, that Paul is communicating that he wants this life transformation to be relational, but I also think that it leads to, uh, specifically in, in Galatians chapter 6, we see another type of transformation that he's talking about, and it's this. That transformation is financial, you know, true believers, true followers of Jesus Christ, true people that have been changed by the grace of God, who have experienced the living God living inside of us, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, what happens is then we begin to seek out the needs of the local church and we begin to give to the local church. You know, we, we just got done with a series about a month or so ago uh, on finances. That series was called Getting, Ra Getting the Right Mindset with God and Money. Uh, if you wanted to check that out, you can go to pursuegod.org forward slash money. But what we talked about in that series is the idea that everything that we have is God's. Our lives, the air that we breathe, our relationships, even our finances, they are all God's. And when I have the right perspective that everything that I have is his, I'm just a manager of it, there's this sense of freedom and liberation that comes in the provision of God, in our relationship with God. Now you might be thinking, well, okay, wait, just a minute here. We've been going through the book of Galatians and now we're throwing in a bait and switch, right? You've got me here uh, at the campus, you've got me online, and now you're going to talk about money. You're going to talk money about money again. You're going to talk about giving again. You're going to talk about what I should do with my money. Well, well, here's what I want you to see. We are studying the word of God. 
And what the Word of God says specifically here is the Apostle Paul is talking about our finances. Listen to what he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. He says, Those who are taught the Word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Now, I don't necessarily mean, uh, think that this means that it's all financial. I think that there are other ways that we can share good things with, with our pastors and our teachers and our leaders. But I do believe that he is talking about our finances. And then he goes on to take it a step further in verse 10. He says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. And so as we study the word of God, Paul is reminding the Galatian church, the, the, the new family of God, he's reminding them that this transformation isn't just relational, but it's also financial. And you see, if you remember back in Galatians chapter 2, one of the things that Paul said in verse 10 was that there was a need in the church, in the early church of Jerusalem. And we go all the way back to Acts chapter 15, where the church was very poor and then they were in need. And Paul was reminding them, you Galatian believers who have been so richly blessed, it is our responsibility to give back to the church. And so what I think Paul is trying to do is he's trying to remind them of this, this idea that everything is God's and that we are to take care of the family of God. We are to take care of our pastors and our leaders and our churches. We are to take care of the vision of the church. We are to advance the kingdom of heaven in our communities. And we have a responsibility to give back to God financially. And you see, when we have the right perspective, we have the ability to do that. The Apostle Paul was saying that this, this the spirit living inside of us, the trans, transformation that happens, it's not just relational. It actually impacts our hearts. And do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6? In verse 21, he says, where, uh, where the desires of your heart or where your, the desires of your heart is, there your treasure is too. And so there's this picture of where we put our value, where we put our dependence, where we put our money will impact our hearts. And Paul was saying, listen, this transformation is part of our finances. And so either way we slice it, when we read God's word, it is clear that what he is saying is that the transformation in us should reach our heart and it should reach our pocketbooks. And so Paul, he expands on this with this picture of reaping and sowing. And we read about it in verses 7 and 8. He says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. He says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But he says, those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. You know, I think for many of us, we come to this verse and we have looked at it and we've read it from a perspective of like the overall everyday life things that happen in our life, what we reap, we sow. And, and, and I definitely believe that when we come to this section of Scripture, we can apply this to other parts of our life. We definitely will reap what we sow. Where we spend our time, we'll see the, res the value of the results in our life. Where we spend our finances, we'll see the value of the results in our life. And so what Paul is saying, he, is he's saying that really what happens is, is the sower decides the harvest that they're going to reap. You see, if we sow all of our resources into our sinful nature or into worldly things, or if our number one desire is to please ourself or to, to sow into our financial well-being or our financial help and not other, help others, we will reap a harvest that will leave us empty. We will reap a harvest that might be enough now, but will eventually lead to death and decay. We will reap a harvest that will fade away. And you see on the other side of that, if we reap into kingdom purposes, if we reap back into the local church, which is the hope of the world, if we reap back or if we sow back our finances into the church or into uh, world missions or into those other believers that are in need, when we begin to do that, 
Our lives are changed, but it will harvest something that will last forever. Everlasting life. Riches that will never fade away. And so here's the truth in this principle. If all we're doing is giving to our own kingdoms or our own pocketbooks or only focused on ourselves, eventually that's going to lead to death and decay. You know, we enter this world with nothing and we will leave this world with nothing. But if we, if we sow into a harvest of the movement of God, if we begin to, to give back financially, if we make it a discipline in our life to give back, maybe it's starting at 1% or 2% or if you have the willingness to do more, it's giving back to the church. When we do that, we will begin to see a harvest in our life. Now, Please don't get me wrong. This isn't saying that if you start giving that you're going to be rich quick. That's not at all what I'm saying. And I don't believe that's what the Bible says. But what I do believe is the promise of God that if we, if we sow back financially to the church, we will reap a benefit. And it might not be here on earth, but it will be eternal. And so Paul is saying, listen, it's relational, but it's also financial. It's also what gets at our heart. And remember that. You know, the last thing that we're going to see today really is the bigger picture. And we see it in the latter verses in Galatians chapter 6. And and I think it's important that we end with this. And it's this, that the, the transformation of the Holy Spirit living in us, changing us from the inside out, it impacts everything about us. It impacts everything in our life individuals. We become new creations. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ become new creations who together we become the new people of God. We become the family of God. And so here's how Paul closes the book of Galatians. Here's how he stamps the final say on a Jesus or salvation is Jesus plus nothing else. You know, remember what the Judaizers were saying to the Gentiles. It was about something else. It was about being Jewish. It was about being chosen people of God and following the laws and the standards. Paul was saying, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we become new creations and we then become the new people of God. And Paul was saying that this doesn't come from any works at all. What it comes from is the unmerited grace of God that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die a death that we deserved for the payment of our sin. And all we have to do is freely receive that gift by our faith. And when we do, we are credited with righteousness and we are made new by the Spirit of God. Galatians 6.15, it doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts, friend? is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. You know, Paul goes on to say it a little bit differently to the Corinthians. I believe he was saying the same thing. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a brand new person. You see, the old is gone and the new life has begun. All of the things that we once wore, the shortcomings, the sins, those things that we were so easily entangled by, they have been forgiven and forgotten. And we become a new creation with the Spirit of God living inside of us, giving us the power to live, to honor Him. You see, that's what Paul is saying. This is the way. This is the way. It's for Jew and it's for Gentile and it's for every single one of us. We become not Jew or Gentile. We become Christ follower. We become Christian because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Friend, that is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. We're not bound to the legal law of Moses. We're not bound to circumcision. We're not bound to our past sin. Nothing can hold us back from the family of God. All we have to do is put our faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing else. That is the message of the gospel. You know, Paul, for the first six chapters of Galatians, he's fighting to help them remember the message of this grace. And I love how he ends the book of Galatians. And this is how I want us to end the series today. We read this in verses 12 through 14. He says, those those who are trying to force you to be circumcised, they want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. 
And even those who advocate circumcision or keeping the law of Moses or following the law, they don't keep the whole law themselves. It says they only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast and claim you as their disciples. But listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And if you are a Christian follower watching online or wherever you're at and what campus you are attending, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says this, as for me, and may this be the same for me as a follower of Jesus Christ. May this be the same for you if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. He says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. Friend, do you know what he's saying there? He's saying that salvation is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus is all that matters. There is nothing in this world more valuable than a relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And there is nothing we can do to earn it. There is nothing we can do to deserve it. The only thing that we can do is to say, thank you, God. Thank you that you love me so much that you left the confines of heaven. You came to this earth. You died on a cross. You put the weight of my sin upon your shoulders. And all I have to do is say, I believe. I repent, I lay down my sins, I make you the Lord of my life. And when you do that, the Bible says you are saved. You are welcome into the family of God. Friend, if you have never done that, we would love to share with you how. You can reach out to us online uh, through the chat room or whatever campus you're attending. We'll have pastors and leaders up front. Christian, do not be so easily swayed by the customs of this world, by the legalistic demands of the Judaizers or any other faith that says you have to work for something. May you rest in the sweet spot of grace and would you rest in the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ and nothing else. Father God, we thank you so much for your free gift of grace. God, words cannot even begin to express how grateful we are that you are a God who loves us, that even despite our own shortcomings and our uh, attempts to go our own way. God, you pursued us and you pursued us so that you could be in relationship with us. And you did that through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that we don't have to uh, feel the weight of legalistic demands or rules or regulations. Instead, God, we can rest upon your grace that you did it all. And so Lord, may that change the way we live. May it change who we are. And when we always look to you for grace alone, through our faith alone. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you.